Uh, hello, everybody. We just waited for two more minutes. Uh, a couple of people are joining us in, and we're just done with our sound check. So, two minutes and we start. A very good evening, everyone. We are extremely elated to have you here with us, both in person and online. I'm Tandi Kadia. And I'm Chen Mai Gavari. And we welcome you all to the inaugural HR Symposium 2022, Research Beyond Method. What began as an initiation to bring students to the forefront of discourse on history and research, so eight of us become a part of creating the symposium. The idea was to make experts answer the questions that we have had on history and research, and therefore bring the community to be a part of the discussion. After all, every one of us at some point has thought about research and what it really is. As students and practitioners of the build environment, it does became key to understand the process that goes into thinking beyond the build into conducting research that is influenced by multiple trajectories associated with the subject. Thus, the symposium. It is a dialogue with which we wish to manifest the exchange of existing and the creation of new ideas and ways to look at research of the built environment. A platform of ideas, of thoughts, and of questions that pushes one to look beyond the concerns of what architectural research is. Of how research transcends beyond being a method to find answers through dialogue. Using dialogue, the symposium intends to begin a conversation that should eventually help us understand and incorporate the approach and trajectories associated with research. This student head symposium shall host dialogues with researchers and practitioners whose works lie in the interdisciplinary fields within and beyond the built environment. The aim is to situate this series of dialogues as markers which expands the idea of how research is imagined, practiced, and reproduced. This will be a hybrid symposium. Participants and panelists from all over will be joining us both in person and online, embracing the new model. Research Beyond Method is a two day symposium that shall host four panels to be in architectural history, research 101, applications of research in the built environment. And the fourth panel as a reflection of the discussion held over the course of two days. For our very first panel today, we think in architectural history, we have Malik Ramadesh and Yakin Tinger in conversation with Atiya Pradiwala, who is joining us from Colombia, and Avni Sethi, who is joining us from Rayo. A warm welcome to all. Malik and Yakin are both students with Masters in Architectural History and Theory here at SEPT University, currently pursuing their individual directed research projects. Their interest in learning in history and theory has resulted in the shaping of this panel, which intends to challenge traditional reading and understanding of the past by presenting alternative forms of history writing and its relevance in the 20th century. Without further ado, we invite Malaka and Yakin to take over. Thanks, Sandeep. 
Uh, again, good evening, everyone. And uh, once again, on behalf of Yadin and I, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the first session of the symposium. Um, I'd like to begin with a little bit, a little brief about uh, what today's panel is about. Today, we take a deep dive into the different ways in which we can read and understand history, particularly in the context of India. There is a growing body of research that is challenging the popular ideas of what constituted history in pre independent India. This emergent form of writing and expression of an alternate history telling through various modes raises questions about the conversation and communication of history thus far. In order to address this, our panelists for today, Abhi Sethi and Athiya Kurakiwala, will share some of the ways in which their investigations into the built environment and its particular histories have guided their methods of approach, analysis, and subsequently enabled them to present history in interesting ways. Before I begin to introduce both of our panelists for today, I'd like to give a brief about the format that the panel discussion is going to follow. We will have, uh, we begin by introducing the panelists, post which each of our panelists will be presenting short presentations. And post this, uh, Yakin and I will engage with a short discussion with both Abhi and Athea. And at the end of both the presentations, we we'll open it up to the audience for a QA. and a I'd like to begin by introducing Abhi Sethi. Abhi Sethi is an interdisciplinary practitioner with her primary concerns lying between cultures of violence, memory, space, and the body. She conceptualized and designed the Conflictorium, a museum of conflict, situated in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, in 2013. The museum has since been home to diverse critical explorations on conflict transformation and art practice. She currently serves as its artistic director. She has also been writing and speaking about the potential of small museums as holding space for social justice processes and the necessity of building care-based ecosystems. She co-curated Mehnat Manzil, a museum of work in Ahmedabad, focusing on informal labor and migration in collaboration with SARS Charitable Trust in 2019. Trained in multiple dance idioms, her performances are largely inspired by syncretic faith traditions and sites of contested narratives. She has been continually interested in exploring the relationship between intimate audiences and the performing body. She is currently nurturing Ordo Performance Collaboratory, a studio space that focuses on performance based experimentations in 2021 in Ahmedabad. She lives and works between Ahmedabad and Raipur in India. Welcome, Abhi. Ateya. Ateya is an assistant professor at Columbia. She is an architectural historian researching the infrastructural environments and ecological landscapes of the developmental Indian state with an interest in the aesthetics of construction materials such as concrete, bamboo, and plastic. Her current book project investigates the plinth as an interface between infrastructure and architecture in developmental discourse in post-World War II India. She is also working on an edited volume Systems and the South Architecture in Development about the diverse architectural strategies and new forms of expertise that found traction in the post war global South. She received her PhD from Harvard GSD and has and was a fellow with the Princeton Mellon Initiative in Architecture, Urbanism, and the Humanities. She was trained as an architect in Mumbai and Caribbean and studied history and theory of architecture at MIT. Both Athiya and Agni bring varied approaches to history and its storytelling as they explore through their works the different trajectories of research and representation within architecture and history. Thank you for taking out the time to share your insights on today's topics. I now request Agni to share her work briefly with us. How brief is brief? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, just. Mm, I was uh, paying attention to the 
to the introduction of the symposium itself and uh, you were saying you were interested in bringing in experts now the thing is that i don't think of myself as an expert on this on this subject at all um i think um uh, I'm really approaching this conversation from the point of view of, uh, at best, maybe an artist who has uh, used research in her work for about a decade now. And that's the place I'm speaking from. Um, I'm also going to actually today refrain from talking or describing the conflictorium per se, partly because... Uh, the conference is being hosted at SEPT University, which is in Ahmedabad and has this kind of proximity with the conflictorium. And so I'm going to take the other route, um, which is actually to share with you 10 insights from 10 years of running, running the conflictorium. And in what way uh, did it sort of really, um, in what way did we build our relationship with what we thought we were doing, which was to build some sort of infrastructure to hold or host um, a certain kind of historical thinking or historical telling or retelling. Um, and it is really within these 10 insights of how we have come to build the conflictorium. Um, I feel like the question of methodology is embedded in it. Um, uh, and, and so I'm... Uh, I'm also admitting people while I do this. Um, you know, um, one of the things that happened at the conflictorium while we were while we were setting up the museum is that um, as a museum of conflict located in Gujarat, one of the first uh, one of the first um, assumptions that are made about what this museum could possibly be uh, telling um, is invariably attached to a specific conflict event in recent history. Um, surprisingly, at the Conflictorium, there is only one part of the museum or one section at the museum that deals with the violence of 2002. Um, the conflict room actually deals with a, a large uh, sort of uh, a large spectrum of conflicts, whether it start whether it is about caste or gender or religion um, or even means of labor within the museum space. Um, now, when we do that, uh, we are dealing with contemporary positions on history or politics. Um, it means that we are a team of people who don't necessarily agree with each other at all points of times. Um, we, are, we, we come from various positions and therefore um, as, a, as a sheer method of doing or rather meaning I've been saying this that you know there's one to write history and one is to do history or to practice history. Uh, and so as, a, as just as a method on, on doing history, uh, one of the things that became evident very early on is that we will have to hone difference and that we will have to move away from the idiom of like-mindedness, which is up, upheld so often as a, as a way of being in the world. Um, um, and so, um, and so comes the, comes the diff difficult aspect of doing uh, or running a museum that's called the Museum of Conflict and yet being able to somehow harvest joy while doing, working with difficult histories. Uh, so for over 10 years, you have a team that is day in and day out, uh, learning, researching, uh, understanding better, designing, curating around the question of conflict. Um, and now, mm, it uh, maybe for the first five or six years of doing this work, it never occurred to us that we need to, to also find joy and attach it as a really serious method uh, somehow of producing the work that we do. Um, um, 
you know, especially post pandemic and, and for a museum, for a physical museum, uh, which is a physical space, uh, the pandemic really opened out some really, um, you know, fundamental questions around how do we engage with our audiences it in, uh, and certain kinds of anxieties also. So if you notice world over and especially in India, uh, a lot of museums started going online. Um, partly with the anxiety of being forgotten, partly with the, the need to continue engagement with audiences. While we, of course, also went online to engage. Um, and, 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 and sort of the Instagram takeover really became our method of speaking to experts or having experts uh, or artists working around ideas around conflict using the Instagram handle as really their site of uh, producing material. Uh, and so uh, a cross section of artists were invited. Uh, Nitya Pillai, who's a Bharatanatyam dancer, who speaks a lot about caste and Bharatanatyam. Um, or uh, Chan, who speaks about um, gendered spaces for students. Um, um, or even someone like Bina Lakshmi Nefram, who has been working in Manipur to demilitarize uh, the region. Um, and, and why we, we produced, uh, why we produced all these uh, digital relationships, um, I think that the fundamental question of why we are a physical space became more and more important for us to answer. Um, and that the digital space couldn't be for us a replacement for what uh, presence could do. Um, it could aid a process. It could be a parallel space. It could be a parallel universe in which many things occur, uh, but wasn't a replacement. And that's something that we learned post pandemic for sure. Um, Um, another thing in, in being or sort of putting together the, the kind of exhibitions that we have been, and I want to specifically speak about the last two or three, um, the last one or the one that's currently running is called Subjects of Surveillance. Um, and uh, the one before that was called Fabricating Love and Other States. These were both inquiries that, um, that the, there were first inquiries around these subjects and then became artifacts. So then became exhibition or film or zine or publication or any such thing. Um, in, in both these, meaning in across all these three inquiries, and this was a method shift that we had done at the museum. Uh, we used to otherwise work with uh, artists or curate exhibitions around thematics until we realized that um, we have a, or rather research has a productivity problem within our museum space. Um, uh, because we could not produce definitive starting points or ending points, uh, we were um, sort of how do I say it? A hyper-productive team that actually gets nowhere after some time because everybody is so exhausted. Um, and the ability to do, uh, often the ability to do more and do many uh, takes over. And, um, and I feel like that, um, that insight uh, about how are we gonna continue to work with historical material? Um, I think that, uh, became a really important thing for us to to kind of put out there. Um, um, The other thing as a museum, and because we chose to inhabit the nomenclature of a museum that deals with, uh, deals with sort of contested narratives, um, in a physical space where one 
one always tends to uh, not perform our innermost uh, experiences in public, especially in a museum, then, then how do we create some kind of space uh, for that to happen? Um, and I think for us, while we are creating that space or through, through exhibition or through installation, um, how does these, how does, for us a question that is recurrent is how do these exhibitions enter a larger historical frame? Um, like for example, at the museum, we have something called the Sorry Tree. Um, you can, uh, and it comes towards the end of your museum journey and you tag the tree and often people leave behind notes, uh, which are extremely personal. Um, it, it's uncomfortable. Uh, because there is anger sometimes, there is uh, emotion. Um, I think part of how one hopes to construct this space, uh, especially because we say, okay, dialogue is welcome and that's the only way to do this work um, or that's the only way to inhabit the space of the museum because for too long, the museum has been opaque. Uh, for too long, the museum has been sort of... Um, you can't, you can't enter it in some senses. Um, how, do, how, how do we continue to do that? Um, I feel like this one is, is something that has, uh, we've had most resistance as in why we developed this insight for the kind of infrastructure we possibly want to build. And while I am talking about infrastructure and I know why the context of this conversation at large is around built environments, I think what I'm also trying to, um, to take our attention towards is uh, about a larger psychosocial space that is made uh, in and around built environments that eventually shape how those environments are used and inhabited. Um, and um, especially when one uses, um, when one works with the archetype of the museum that um, draws parallel or uh, invariably draws uh, a fraught history from authority or having authoritative narrative, um, then doubt becomes, uh, a contested, a contested method to to really be building infrastructures of any kind. Um, um, yeah. Um, the other, and and I feel like increasingly becoming one of the most important. Um, experiences of running a space like a museum. And, and I, I, I constantly move between calling ourselves a museum and then calling us a, like a museum. Um, you know, very early on, and I share an anecdote, when we were thinking through the name of the conflictorium, uh, one of the things that uh, somebody on our board or suggested to us that you know maybe you shouldn't call yourself a conflictorium it's too negative maybe you should call yourself a center for art and conflict um, and uh, and why we desisted this uh, kind of and uh, uh, you know need to call ourselves a center for and um, walked in with uh, with great amount of naivety uh, into wanting to inhabit the museum um, and sort of thinking of the narrative inside from within, uh, maybe eat it up completely and turn it on its head to some extent, um, but, but still hanging on to some, to that framework. I think there was validity in that. And I, I, I still continue to feel there is validity in that frame, um, but it is, uh, I think the challenge is how does one find that kind of freedom constantly within it because it's a, it is a tight frame it is it is a restrictive frame mm. 
um, I I already spoke about this and and uh, you know also in terms of um, the singular narrative or the I mean for us at the conflictorium one of one important aspect of our work or it's been a shifting it's been a shifting space is who's the curator is there a singular curator who curates um, who curates experiences who tells uh, who tells or retells um, ideas around history i think uh, this got dismantled for us very early on so something like um, the memory lab which is at the conflictorium is is, is a lab which has empty jars, glass jars, and little notes, uh, which really invites uh, audience participants to add or leave behind objects that best signify uh, or represent uh, a personal conflict in their life and invite them to add a note on, on what this is about. Now, um, could we be telling a, or could we be building narratives around conflict only through the large, anything that's mounted as public or is mounted at, at a scale, uh, which only feels like it's, it's the scale of the nation or scale of society, um, but to also insert within it that the scale of the intimate is really where, um, where this infrastructure comes alive. Um, it's when society or the nation becomes accessible. It's primarily through the personal. Um, yeah. Um, we've often, you know, uh, started thinking through method or st started thinking through program. Um, and within the infrastructure, someone leaves uh, or someone dies. Um, and uh, a question that we have come back to ask ourselves is that uh, as an institution dealing with the question of history or conflict, um, do we continue an institutional agenda or let, should we just let it go because a person a person left. And that's not great institutional thinking, right? Because institutions must carry on what they do irrespective of who comes and who goes. Um, and I think uh, it's never been able to be like that, uh, partly because of the scale that we are working with, uh, partly because when research, partly because when research was happening for that, what was understood uh, through experience, through the tactile, through being present, could never be transmitted either in the form of text, image, video, ever. Um, and often we have just, um, we've just acknowledged that absence and become something else. And my last point, um, is on the question of visibility. Um, and uh, and all the more to, that I, I, I speak today and, and that we are in a time, we are, we are speaking, or I am speaking to you right now, in a time when uh, we are actually in an age of this kind of hyper, hyper bliss and hyper visibilities. Um, and uh, they have been detrimental. They could be detrimental. Uh, um, and how do we how do we find methods that work work within it, disrupt it, uh, subvert it? Um, yeah, I think these are these are some of my thoughts. And uh, more, maybe there's more in conversation later. Thank you, Abhi. I would now request Adriana to present her work. So let me unmute, unmute, and then let me share my screen. Uh, so are you seeing this? 
Let me full screen it. All right. Uh, hey, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm um, really honored to be speaking and speaking on the subject. Uh, let me. So, you know, I, I think um, Yakin mentioned the book that we've been working on. It's done. Uh, and so it's super exciting to share it. It's not physically out. It's going to be out now in like, I think, two weeks physically, but it's already available digitally. So um, I, I, I realize that we don't have like a chat function or anything, so I can't put a link to it. But if you Google um, the title and if you Google aggregate, you'll find the aggregate website. And I, I think the whole introduction is on there. So um, please go find it. We'll be so happy, you know, for people to find um, sort of things that they're interested in out in this in this book. And so I thought um, today I'd say a little bit about what it was, you know, the, the kind of history writing project that we engaged in and maybe using the book as an example, I can sort of talk about some of the things that you encounter when you're trying to do architectural history. And I talk a little bit as much, I'm, you know what, I'm gonna set a timer so that I can like, uh, make sure that because I think the question answer model is great. It'll allow us to, you know, it, because it's so big, the work is so big. I wanted to you that we start working on this in 12, you know, in literally 10 years to make it happen. Um, and so time scales of main historical work, you know, going to archives, uh, synthesizing material, it's not short. It doesn't happen quickly. So if you've ever, you know, encountered like if you've ever felt like you wanted to do a project and that project is somewhat, you know, taking time to find its argument, find its thesis, um, know that you are, you know, that's a thing all researchers face. It takes a, because you're also working on so many things at the same time, right? You don't know what, what piece of what will go where and how it'll kind of exist out in the world. So anyway, so you know, I'll rely on 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 the question on uh, the questions to sort of direct what extra information I give you. But let me tell you a little bit. So you know, um, the book is edited by Aggregate, and that's how it's called. Like the author is Aggregate, and what that what what the reason for that is that we really try to think of history writing as a collective project. You know, very much with academic work you are always in dialogue with your peers, but uh, only one name goes on a text and that's important because that's the person who bears responsibility for the arguments that they're making. But uh, there should also, there should need also to be ways to um, acknowledge the collective work that goes into producing text. Um, the way that the aggregate process works is that, um, you you know you put out a call for papers and I, you could go look at the I think the we dash aggregate dot something com or org I'm not sure but oh here we dash aggregate dot org you can see it here in the on on the slide anyway so you can go there and you can look at their process and what they work on is this um, uh, uh, open peer review process so you know if you're familiar with ac academic publishing um, uh, uh, you know and history like writing historical work you submit it and it's blind peer reviewed so the people who review it don't know whose work they're reviewing and the people who are uh, and you will never know uh, who has reviewed your work and you get comments and the idea of that is to you know prevent a uh, certain kind of uh, biases you know the, the idea is to kind of put an imagination of objectivity on the uh, act of reviewing the work. But of course, we all know that these are complicated and what happens is a lot of people who may not have um, the, uh, you know, the training have the kind of institutional history of, like, of, of knowing how to present an argument, even though they have really good work, they get left behind because they're not able to, that work is not seen uh, for its potential sometimes in the blind peer review process. So, so, so aggregate, you know, we work with an open peer review process. And the idea of there being that uh, we know exactly who's reading our work and, but we're always in dialogue. So all of us, you know, so I put the list of authors the editors are on the top of the authors. Uh, all the editors have an essay in the book as well, but we met, you know, multiple times. We met, I think at least three times, uh, two times digitally, one time physically. Uh, we all got together. We all read each other's work. We commented, we had discussions. In fact, you know, sometimes we had discussions that were so, um, sort of that challenged the foundations of the project so much that we had to shelve the project for like four years. So, you know, after the 2012 discussion, um, 
we didn't actually get a chance to get back to it until 2017. And then we really um, got back to making sure that uh, we could address some of the criticisms that the project received. And, <clears throat> you know, one of the criticisms is really on this idea of the global South, right? Like what is the global South? What is the relevance of it? How does it kind of, um, uh, how, how, what afford? for you as a researcher to talk about a concept as such as the global south. And so I, th I thought I'd address that a little bit here, is, uh, you know, and why it says systems and the emergence of the global south. Because if you take a kind of bracketing of the developmental period sometime from, you know, 1945, the end of World War II, and um, a sort of a United States American interest in the third world, and 1985 as a kind of end of that project with uh, the you know liberalization of uh, various sort of third world economies and if if you take that kind of bracketing uh, what you could argue is that it is this you know period of development that leads that that creates the conditions for something like the global south to emerge but you know again what is the global south uh, we can think of it as a kind of um, as a as a as a set of economic conditions that forces you know nation states into a particular kind of relationship with each other um okay so sorry that's super vague uh, i'm trying to be as um, concise as possible um so I, I, you know, I mean, I have like all of these slides of my essay as well, which I don't think I'll get to. But what I wanted to kind of uh, be very sort of, uh, it, oh, right. Okay, so one of the things about, you know, talking about the global South is it gives you an opportunity to push back against a kind of nationalist idea of writing history, you know, so I work in architectural history and I write about India, but by putting this book together, it gives you a chance to see the, some of the structural similarities and differences between um, different you know, countries that are experiencing similar kind of economic pressures. Uh, so let me, just, let me just show you a few more slides and hopefully uh, that will, uh, put a little more, you know, give you a little more of a concrete idea of wh where I'm coming from. Okay, so I was super interested in my work and, you know, my, my book is also about this. I'm writing about a kind of long history of famine and modern architecture. I'm happy to talk about that uh, a little bit more. But one of the things I was really interested in is, you know, images like, like this image for me, so many contradictions in it. On the one hand, you know, you're seeing waste like it's a story of grain that is rotting but on the other hand there's also a kind of aesthetics of abundance like you're also being treated to this idea that oh but look at how much we were able to produce so there's two stories that being told that are being told here at least minimum there are stories for example also look at all the plastic you know there's a story of some sort of technological modernity and architectural transformation in in, in terms of how plastic becomes so central to um, how, 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 uh, to how we think of the notion of shelter. Um, and that's, and, and so when on the one hand you have this very kind of old, like, like this idea of, uh, oh, there's a primitive hut, you know, like it's basically man wanting to shelter himself from the elements that creates architecture. But on the other hand, uh, you have this very technically sophisticated uh, material like plastic. Um, it's actually low density polyethylene, specific, more specifically, that, um, that you see here that uh, is doing this sort of very old work of sheltering something. Um, and so I was sort of interested in this image also because when I saw it, I thought, oh, you know, one of the stories that we tell as a country is that uh, the problem with grain is that here it is rotting. We're not able to deliver it to the people who, are, who need to eat it. And what I discovered is actually, um, you know, institutions that are, that, that, that do the work of, you know, managing grain. So for example, the Food Corporation of India, they're more, they, they are interested in delivering grain, but they're more interested in managing the price of grain. And so what I realized is that all of these architectural forms, they're not sheltering 
um, as much as they are uh, changing the value of a commodity. You know, so they have a very different relationship to a commodity than you might think in the first instance. And so we can think of, you know, sheds, warehouses as um, architectural forms that are interested in manipulating and managing value, not so much physical bodies, but economic values. And I thought that that was a really interesting insight, you know, and, and so I kind of followed it through in this paper. I have one minute left and I will... Um, just give you a kind of show you some nice images. So hopefully, we, so this is Nehru in Chicago, outside Chicago, um, you know, looking at grain silos. And I, 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 one of the things I end up arguing in the chapter is that grain silos represent a kind of monumental, monumental, you know, visual instance of excess. But actually, this tells you more, this kind of image does more work to show you that excess. Um, so grain silos didn't work so symbolically, but they were a kind of massive infrastructural um, intervention for its monumentality as much as for its, um, sorry. Uh, all right, I'm gonna take one more minute just to show you some slides. Okay, so this is actually in outside Delhi in this little town of Hapur and it was a gift. So this was an entirely precast uh, silo that was sent on ships and kind of built. There were two of them, one has been demolished, this one is still existing. Um, and then the other thing I sort of argue in this essay is that uh, shell structures actually were really uh, experimented on for warehouse production, you know, so for pr uh, protecting grain. And uh, so, so, so some, you know, what I wanted to kind of, this is a very, very um, simplistic version. And I urge you to read the chapter for the more complex version of this story. Uh, but when you see, you know, iconic shell structures and uh, this is Chaudhary's uh, shell roof at, in, for IIT Delhi, it, you, you don't only have to remember the kind of relationship to modern architectural history, you know, to the kind of um, story of, of uh, building, you know, modern identity through architectural form, but you can also remember a story of protecting grain. So, so I wanted to make a case that, you know, you can think of different um, uh, uh, gene genealogies for certain architectural forms. And then the other one, so here's another silo, and there was a lot of um, advertising in concrete, uh, in concrete uh, journals about how silos were built. And I wanted to, and, and then I saw that Kanchenjunga used the same technology, um, this technology here, you know, slip forming to build its core. And I thought, oh, that's super interesting because here you can see again, this sort of um, project that we think of with one, you know, history with one genealogy of Korea sort of, um, resolving the courtyard in the sky question with, uh, uh, you know, and learning from uh, Corbusier and Unite, we can also think of another geneolo genealogical history of this. Uh, and that's, you know, the history of uh, building silos for cement and grain. And, and I have this whole thing in the chapter where I talk about the similarities between cement and grain, and as said, urge you to read it. All right, um, here a little bit more on the plastic. I won't go into it, but yeah, I wanted to say that this looks really simple and it's often very vilified as like, oh, this is bad, you know, we need billings, but actually this is very high tech. Uh, and, and, and so appearances can be uh, deceiving. Okay, so that's it. And I look forward to your questions. And I also really loved a lot of the things you said of me and I look forward to us being able to talk about them. Thank you, Atiya. So uh, thanks for both of these interesting presentations. I have a few thoughts. So I start with what Agni presented. Uh, Agni was speaking about how she gets conflict and alternate ways of the past to the people through her museum. Museum as a place, the conflictorium as a place of discussing the different narrations of the past uh, and bringing it, bringing it in the public domain. And Ajiya was also talking about an alternate way of looking at things and, and it is more of an academic inquiry where she is coming from. Uh, I think what was common in both of the presentations at a larger scale was that uh, the understanding of bringing something from the past in an alternate way in terms of the evidence, which 
and further nuance and inform the ways we look at, at the past, different understandings of the past, and also the methodology and the theorization of it. So uh, when we look at this, you both were also talking about different scales. For instance, Avni also went to the extent of the intimate scale, and Athiya was also talking about scales in, in that sense. So one of the questions which emerges from this uh, discussion for me is, then how do we how do we think about it both in terms of the academic relevance and also getting it to the people as both of you have different directions to take it to the people so if you could address this question of the alternate histories and getting it to the people and also the academic representation of it at different scales and how do you navigate through evidence methodology and theorization i think that would be helpful so any one of you can start um, I, I, I mean, that's a huge question, <laughs> and I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if I can uh, do any justice to answering it. I feel like you know we need an, an like, I, I, I don't even know where to begin with that. But I do have something to say about scale, which is that uh, you know it's interesting because I tend to work at the sort of scale of the state and their infrastructural interventions, but actually I began my project at this idea of the intimacy of eating that what is it that when you know you throw tea, um, I, I mean, I began at the intimacy of famine, like the starving body, where does the starving body, how, how does it kind of fit into the narrative of, of building nation states? And I, you know, and, and one of the things that came up super early when writing my dissertation was that um, you link Chandigarh win you elections, but bring people food wins you, that becomes the kind of, uh, foundation for the legitimacy of the state. And so how do you, so, so the question then became, how can you write something like architectural history starting from the scale of the intimacy of eating? Um, anyway, so it's what I'll say a little bit now, I'll turn it off uh, if you have other to say, and then we could sort of get into some of more of, you know, more of the questions that you can pose to us. Um, you know, for me, I, uh, I can't somehow separate these, these three, if I had to put, if I had to think of them as three scales, no, as the intimate scale, as the human mm -hmm. scale, and as a monumental scale, I'm not sure yeah. whether they're really separate from each other. Uh, mm -hmm. What the monumental scale does is actually to somehow influence what is happening to the most intimate. Um, yeah. What the intimate scale does is to, in some sense, yeah. upturn what is monumental. So I'm not yeah. sure. I want to imagine them as separate at all. They are completely dependent or their affective sides are completely dependent on each other. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's quite interesting in the way that you sort of put it. And I have another simpler question that he has just asked. So, I mean, I think uh, Atiya was coming from the perspective of how, you know, there is a certain kind of a history that can be looked at in an alternative way in an academic sense. And Avni is coming from the perspective of how it can be more interpretative and experiential, say, through the topology of the museum. But, and you have in many ways brought, you know, a lot of issues and contestations or some gaps in the way that, you know, certain histories have been written or have been, have, have come to public notice. But, why do you think it's important for us to sort of go back to these kind of uh, gaps and to sort of fill them and then sort of make it more accessible to say a non-academic or a non-architectural, non-historical kind of uh, kind of an audience? Um, Avni, do you want to start? Should I go? Me? Okay. <laughs> um, so. You know, I, I don't think of myself as um, filling gaps. I always, I think of myself, in fact, in the other way, in which is revealing gaps. And I think that's really the work of history, you know, that you sort of, um, that you destabilize the very myth mythologized and complete narratives that uh, exist about how things come to be. The kind of filled, narrative of filled gaps is actually very much uh, how, how, you know, nation states sort of, create propaganda for themselves, right? And so you want to poke holes in that and reveal gaps. So I would argue very strongly that writing history is about 
poking holes rather or not not like poking holes I mean violent and making holes where there aren't there but revealing them you know and showing the kind of gaps that exist one of the things that I found fascinating about what Avdi said which I thought maybe we could go a little bit into is well she said so many interesting things but I'll point out two right now one is she was like I'm not an expert and I was like yeah that's true neither am I in fact what I like to do in my work is reveal the kind of the ways in which expertise itself um like you know we think that oh you have an expert and they bring their expertise to a situation and this was key for developmental india right like developmental india you're bringing all of these experts and foreign experts you know food experts uh, we want to build experts we want universities so that we can make more experts but there was a sort of funny way in which it's like expertise is not knowing something but it's sort of having the institutional capacity to enter into the unknown and still speak with authority and so you're speaking with authority about things you don't actually know about because so much of the work that was happening at the time was so singular like say building a dam that kind every dam is unique right like you can't just take Uh, because every geography is unique rivers are unique like you can't just trans, trans you know you can't just do technological transfer and so expertise in itself emerges as actually a very unstable category that sort of um that, that and so we don't want to be experts right that's not what historians are trying to do in fact they're trying to kind of pull apart the narratives that produce expertise as a kind of authority uh, and then the other thing that she said was super interesting and i thought you know i have many thoughts on this as well is that how like you go back to one moment of conflict and i feel like with independence you tend to always go back to partition as conflict you know as that the one kind of moment of violence but actually the partition is one sampling of a huge legacy of violence of you know colonial and both colonial and nation building violence and so how do you then and and, and again when i was start talking about food i was interested in the violence experienced every day in feeling hungry you know that's how do we dis- how do we describe that kind of state you know that sort of violence that it, that it, that threads through your everyday to the extent that um and, and and i was interested in the kind of sciences that take something like um uh famine but then turn it into something like oh malnutrition or um uh cal- caloric value and so sort of scientize it in a very specific quantitative way and uh, then use that to produce certain kinds of legitimacy but like you know you someone like amartya sen can say that oh we've never had a famine but of course even he has to admit that there is widespread hunger so you know that that the dis- that shifting discourses has actually been super important to how uh legitimacy is constructed so those are my um thoughts and i will turn it over to you abhi thanks so i think one word which i'll borrow from abhi was visibility and she was talking about the visibility of conflict and uh, the other thing is visibility of food so i think both of them are quite in our face right both of them food is also like yeah it's a part of our lives and so is conflict both of them are immensely visible and still i think there is some lack of thought or discussion perhaps in those terms which you are trying to get in through your work so uh, in general how do we represent and rethink through something which is existing but how do, does a scholar or how does an activist or how does a person in general bring these issues out what what do you do to get it out so perhaps ateya you can highlight on ways of writing and how do you get that out through your work and avni you it's up to you how do you get it to the public like how do you uh, put it in front of us yeah um you know i actually uh, i'm i'm only second seconding what you're talk, what you're saying at about legitimacy and while i speak at length about you know the discomfort of occupying this or inhabiting this nomenclature of museum because it really borrows or we borrowed it as a strategic entrance we just borrowed nomenclature so we could speak with legitimacy uh, where we had none you know we are not st- we are not state run no we are, we are just like a bunch of very young people who came together and say we will we will practice history um <laughs> so so to answer your question uh, this new idea that that 
has been posed on how does one do it and how does one do it say through art practice or through culture practice and i don't i don't think of architecture as very far from culture practice i actually often think of it as a fulcrum where culture practice can that you know culture can be practiced at and within and outside uh, sometimes within it and most often against it so um i i, I have a sense that we um there's something about experiencing the world fully completely um unmediated where the making really lies um it's when my entire experience of what is happening to me is mediated by another whether it is uh where the media wants to construct for me my experience of how i imagine this regime or when um a food blogger wants to construct my imagination of how i how i experience food on my plate and therefore we we have entered a space where every experience can be mediated where the need to actually analyze identify analyze and produce my own understanding of phenomena in fact you is not required anymore you can experience the world completely mediated now this to me is um actually by design when you lose the capacity to actually have an opinion of your own um you are um you are fairly desirable subjects of uh, power structures uh the moment you have you have the ability to critically understand phenomena you are going to be accountable citizens and therefore be difficult you it will be difficult to mediate you and i, I and i really feel like that's where the possibility of making rests um to make in the world Yeah, I mean I I think it's fascinating you know what you're talking about because it's like the museum is this like very colonial institution and then to kind of take it at how, how do you take this kind of form and do radical work with it and I have to say you know it's very similar with uh, publishing right with books like for where for you the museum is the point that you know you interface with the public because I think that's what uh, that's one of the questions that Yakin is trying to get us to sort of think about which is how do we interface with our audience and uh, of course in publishing you interface via your book you know you sort of put all of this sort of energy out there into in in into this text and you hope it connects with uh, with someone who's uh, who, who you know i i mean i we used to play this game when i was a student which is like what are what are the three books that you know changed how you might uh see or or you could you could even do like what are the top five lectures that sort of helped you find your uh, and it's really fun it's really fun to hear about how people kind of interface with uh, um uh, scholars or academics or speakers or anyone out there and it's 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 complicated because books also have all of these sort of you know they're expensive they're really expensive to buy you need libraries you need all sorts of infrastructures but then you also need language you know you need to you need access to certain kinds of jargon to be able to understand what people are saying and so i don't have a good answer for how to fix all of these you know i really don't um but i i, I think like somehow Oh gosh, I don't I don't know where I was going with that. But I think that something about the form of the book as a kind of way to be able to because once you once you write a book you almost don't want to talk about it anymore, you know, you're like that's done, it's out there, just read the book. Um but of course books are very much like what you read in that little, you know, if 10,000 words is like sitting on top of tons of information that you'll never hear about unless you know you know how to ask a question but you don't even know what question to ask usually to get there but anyway sorry i that i feel like that's a bit of a detour on my own um, sort of anxieties around um, what, what the, the sort of a pros and cons of publishing but uh, let's turn it back to you guys for your next question 
Yes, um, thank you, Agni and Ajay. I actually have just one final question from me and then I'll sort of open it up to the audience. Okay, Yakim has one, so maybe after that. But um, both of you, I think you're uh, you're looking, you're trying to say that history is not kind of linear, you know. There is a certain uh, interconnectedness with sort of, you know, what is happening outside of, say, a particular historical event and how that sort of connects to forming like an alternative understanding or an alternative reading. Uh, Atiya, for example, in, in your work, you're looking at technology, you're looking at economics, you're looking at a lot of things that are Uh, um, hello, sorry. We missed the last bit of what you said. Oh, sorry. No, I was just saying that uh, at the end, no work. Oh, can you still hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Great. Sorry. What I was trying to say is that you're sort of approaching uh, sort of oblique ways, I guess, you know, whether through technology, through economics, through land, to sort of come to talk about the brain silo as a typology and then larger sort of effect on how a sort of historical development happens say, in India. Um, Agni, for example, is also looking at, you know, there is a certain, say, historical event, but how are the ways in which you can sort of represent it or, you know, um, yeah. bring the public in a way that is sort of uh, interactive. But what I'm trying to get at is that both in both ways, I think there is a kind of interdisciplinary approach. So, for example, you are looking at architecture, but you're also looking at culture, you're also looking at um, society, you're also looking at other things. So, how do you think this kind of an interdisciplinary approach is actually, you know, can become popular or is becoming popular in the way that we write and represent history? Well, I, 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 I think the, you know, this uh, emergence of interdisciplinary suddenly as a category, uh, meaning let's, let's rewind a little uh, and say that, wait, the world is interdisciplinary. That is how the world functions. Now, within academia, if interdisciplinarity has come, has found articulation, um, doesn't mean that we suddenly started, uh, our approaches didn't suddenly become interdisciplinary. They probably just aligned themselves to how the world functions better. I mean, that's at least how I experienced it. Like, so for example, when I was studying design at, in Bangalore at Srishti, um, and uh, I, I graduated from a program that at that point of time was called Sangama Interdisciplinary Lab. But at this point, it I find it really like unproductive to say that to anybody that, oh, if this is what I stu studied. I often say, you know, I, I, uh, I was part of a cohort of eight of us who were just non-committal, who didn't want to choose communication design or industrial design. And we did a little bit of everything. Um, <laughs> and uh, invariably, all, uh, almost all eight of us are... Uh, are making sense of the world using as many um, as many tools as possible. So, um, uh, and especially when you are using the word representation at the museum, or how do we rep represent? And I find myself increasingly at a a, at a discomfort with this, this question of representation at the museum. I think we are even pre-representation. I think if we barely manage to present, mm -hmm. uh, I think we would have done enough. I was like, the, so first of all, let me say interdisciplinarity is so very hard because, um, so interdisciplinarity is very much a kind of, I like, First, to have inter to be interdisciplinary, you first of all need disciplines, and so you have to ask the question: What are disciplines? So I want to put on my little like professor hat, you know, and uh, talk a little bit about um, what 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 that means. Like my work is in a sense a little bit interdisciplinary, but it's not very interdisciplinary. Which is what do I mean by that? Which is that 
I'm not trained at all like an anthropologist. You know, I don't do any ethnographic work. I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't do that kind of work at all. I talk about economics, but I'm not an economist. And I certainly don't, you know, ever imagine making like doing economic work, right? Like I don't write economics, I don't do that, but I read it. We can read whatever we want, you know, we can read, but I'm not an anthropologist. I'm, I read anthropology. I'm not an economist, but I read that. I read history and then I do the work of, you know, somewhere between history and architectural history where, I mean, don't, don't even ask me what the difference is between those two. There's not any difference. I just use the words as just to, in a sense, say that, um, you know, I do the sort of historical work and I rely on all of this other stuff. But the, 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 let me tell you a little bit historically about like, so you have, you know, in academia, you have the emergence of disciplines, right? So what are disciplines? Philosophy. And that has its own method of inquiry. I read philosophy, but I'm not a philosopher. Um, uh, and then you have literature, right, or um, English, or you have all of these disciplines, history, anthropology. Um, and then what happened with the Cold War, with, with, you know, World War II, there's this like major shift in academia, where they're like, wait a minute, so in history, you have someone studying Indian history, or South Asian history, or, you know, whatever, or in linguistics, you have someone studying Sanskrit studies. But can we also have, a, you know, South Asia studies department. And what that does is actually creates a department that's not a discipline because South Asia is not a discipline, it's an area. And so this is what, you know, in academia you call area studies. And so it's post-World War II that you get the rise of area studies, particularly because, you know, a kind of economic powerhouse like the United States is interested in um, preventing the spread of communism. And it's interested in investing in people studying places that they want to be able to send um, their exports to. And so um, the, the, the kind of shift from discipline to area that has then divided the world up into pieces really happens because of certain political shifts in, acad in the academy in you know, the mid 20th century. Now, what we need to do a little bit is push back against that area studies model to get out of the nation state framework and kind of get back into a kind of disciplinary model because disciplinary um, processes actually, I mean, I think the key thing about disciplines is to realize that they have, that their methodologies are somewhat, um, like you have to make up a methodology and then you kind of it, it affords you the capacity to get to certain conclusions, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a kind of absolute truth. And so, so I think with interdisciplinarity, especially in terms of learning, you kind of find all these different methods to get at some idea. But uh, it's, I mean, if I had to train as an anthropologist and as an economist and as a historian and as a philosopher, I, you know, it, it's, it, this is why interdisciplinarity is just so very hard. And we kind of, what we need, what, what, one of the ways we manage it is by training in one discipline, but reading widely. And so you have a kind of capacity to, you know, read, but not necessarily do those other, like perform those other disciplinary um, methods. So hopefully that helps, particularly in terms of understanding, one, that this is a historical situation, that we've sort of found ourselves in these disciplinary categories, but at the same time, we want to work with them and challenge them, but we also want to be rigorous. And so, you know, you can't, you, you sort of have to be able to do both of those things, right? Like be rigorous, but also not, um, I don't want to be a bad anthropologist is what I'm trying to say. I'd rather be a good historian. Thank you. Uh, actually, there are a few questions which are quite central to our panel, which I would like to comprise in the small time uh, we have. So the first question that comes to my mind is, what were the challenges when you were working with such kinds of histories? The second is, uh, how does our past inform us today? How does it uh, affect us today in a way? Which you have somewhat covered in the talks before, we have been talking about it. And the third, I think what is most critical, one of the most critical is, how does architectural history contribute to the past, understanding of the past? And how does architectural history kind of, uh, you know, give us this new perspective or a, a fresh perspective to look at the past? So if you could have just a quick answer to that and then we could move to the audience. Um, me? Should I go? Should I? Um, so, you know, 
Oh, where to, let me gather my thoughts quickly. So I, I think that a kind of attention to the built environment, what like, the, I, I think that's in a sense the question that you're asking me, right? Like what is a kind of expertise or knowledge of the built environment afford? How does it kind of help history? Um, where I'm trying to think of which example might sort of work here. So let me let me give you the example of famine in the 19th century. I was fascinated by how the public works department um, became really invest like became a really important aspect of managing famine. And I think that uh, and 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 the and what happens is that the public works department in kind of building both in st structures like you know, railway houses or things like that, or, or guest houses or, you know, lodgings and infrastructure tanks and wells and roads. And um, in doing both those things, it sort of shapes the idea of the, you know, modern rural temporary laborer, the kind that you kind of see associated with something like uh, NREGA, you know, Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. And uh, in that sense, it was interesting to me that you know architectural history by paying attention to that kind of built landscape was able to contribute something to famine studies where famine was really thought of as an economic uh, or, or a condition of deprivation or you know geographical and meteorological condition but actually it had this but, but by seeing how things were built you, and, and how labor was deployed you could kind of understand famine not just as a a, a kind of physical phenomenon as a you know climatic phenomenon or like an economic phenomenon but as a or a political phenomenon because it famine is very much a man-made disaster let me be very clear about that but also as a kind of um uh, it's uh, the, the management of it is very much deeply connected into I ideas of construction and design um on an aesthetic front you know i think that uh uh, one of the things you said about the visibility of things, I think that what architecture really afforded was a kind of a capacity to see where investment was going. Um, for the World Bank, it was super important to invest in kind of architecture and infrastructure because it gave them something tangible to uh, it, 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 that you can show that, oh, this was developed. But there's a lot of conflict here, you know? So for instance, if you think of someone like Albert Meyer's work in Etava, um, what he ends up concluding is that, oh, no, I cannot build architecture. We have to build societies and then they have to build their own, you know, communities and they have to build their own architecture. I mean, his plan was extremely flawed as well. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes by tracking architecture, you can understand certain schemes of power in a way that you can't with other in, in other ways. But at other times, you also sort of have to... Um, yeah, try and understand architecture writ large. So you can talk about things like the transformation of the landscape or infrastructure and, and attention to its physicality and materiality, I think is really something that uh, architectural historians are able to kind of address that because they have certain tools in their toolkit. Um, but I don't know, is that hopefully that's good enough for now and of me, maybe you have some other thoughts on, you know, where, what are some of the ways in which architectural history specifically contributes to history? I also want to be very clear that I think architectural history is just history. Um, I actually just have a small anecdote, anecdote to share from setting up the museum. And in some ways, to at large connect what the history or the architectural history of uh, this building that we are located in. Uh, what was that and how much it influenced the choices we made or the histories we told henceforth. This building was donated to us by a woman called Bachu Ben Nagarwala. She was a Parsi woman who lived absolutely alone in this building. She was 98 years old when she passed. She, she died single without an heir. And she, therefore she donated this building. She was a beautician. She was a hairstylist. And she was Ahmedabad City's first trained hairstylist. And when we received this building, we received 
everything that was attached to the history of this woman's life, everything that was attached to her, starting from when she was a child to when she died, to her objects, to the marks on the building, to how the building was perceived within the neighborhood, which is half Hindu and half Muslim, and this is a Parsi household. The decisions that were then taken after this building, which is called Gul Lodge, uh, the very decision that this building should now become the Museum of Conflict was taken because this building belonged to Gul, to do Bachuben Nagarwala and it was called the Gul Lodge and that was its reality. Um, so it wasn't like we went out looking for a building to make the Museum of Conflict. Um, I'm answering your question in a kind of, uh, you know, I'm catching my ear from the other side. But what I'm trying to say is that if we wouldn't take what the history of that particular built environment is into account, this museum and its future tellings would look nothing like what they are today. Now, th thanks a lot for the answers. Now we would like to ask the audience if they have any questions. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jason. Uh, I'm in final year architecture for uh, my university. I just, uh, I, I'm very, very curious uh, while I was uh, at your uh, presentation. And uh, when we talk about history, for me, uh, I, I think like, you know, people, everyone has their own perspective on how they look back to what they look like in that particular part because we have never experienced it. So there are multiple perspectives that uh, generates different narratives for different people on how they look back to that incident. So in architecture, uh, if I talk about an object or a build form or a building, when I look at it, uh, sometimes I have you know, some sort of like perks, different perspective uh, or like doing the study, uh, there are multiple narratives that turn it in your mind that also conflicts your thought, right? Sometimes it is more of uh, how do I say, uh, more philosophical, and sometimes it can be factual, right? So, like, how, what what do you uh, think, like, you know, how to deal with those different narratives? Or, like, if I want to, uh, like, when we talk about legend, legitimacy of a particular narrative, then how do we support it? Uh, or like, uh, are there any methods by which you know, like I can translate those philosophical narratives for uh, for a particular building into more factual, or like, uh, or it can become more factual? So like, I don't know. Um, dear, what a fascinating question. I mean, I think that uh, in a sense, your question goes a little bit to the question to the politics of archives. You know, like who appears in the archive and who doesn't, because I think like maybe of me wants to speak more about this, but like what happens to all the people who aren't, you know, written into the physical record. And so the historian doesn't even have access to their voice. How do you like capture the kind of plurality of voices when you are, um, especially when sometimes all you have is a building? Um, and I think that one of the methodologies that comes out of architectural history is very much reading against the grain um, in the sense of how do you, uh, how do you almost read the marks on the walls as a kind of uh, archive of this person's life. Um, and I, I, I mean, I turned to something one time that Gayatri Chagravati Spivak said in her talk that I just found so, you know, um, uh, in, inspirational and influential to me, which is she talked about this idea of teleopoesis. And, you know, if you break that word down, tele, which is at a distance and poesy, which is a kind of imaginative act. And she was saying that sometimes you, the only way to capture the voice of someone who's lost in the archive is to sort of triangulate. So you find different narratives and then in between those different narratives, you might be able to capture this person and you might get it wrong. 
but you might but but that is that's why you know i, I mean we we don't think in fact one of the words used very much was facts like how do we get to the facts but those facts are sometimes erased right like the archives are erased the uh, documents are gone the there were no documents necessarily um, you know very fascinatingly sometimes in the british archive only the criminals show up so you don't have the kind of i mean that's where you get the whole idea of the subaltern from right like how do you write subaltern history um and yeah there's different ways in which historians treat that and one of them is like by looking at buildings because those tell different stories those have different archives those act as archives in a different way um of um, maybe you have more to say about this um i actually have an example um so there used to be a what do you call it a, a shrine a shrine on the shahi bagh road just before you go just after you get off subhash bridge and before you go down the underbridge that takes you to shahi there used to be a shrine it used to be a shrine um of a very noted poet and what we would call uh, the father of the urdu language so he was someone who came he he has he's known with multiple names and i will reveal the name but in the telling of the story it's important that i don't that um you know he came to gujarat from the dakhan and really made this his home um and in a mixture of languages between hindi dakhani gujarati developed what we today know uh, or the first strands of what we today know as modern urdu um and therefore he wrote extensively in this newly formed language and people who came after him from galib to mir taki mir have all made references to his greatness so that's the over or that that is the poet i'm talking I mean, that that's his space or position in in urdu literature um now on one unfortunate day which was the 27 28 february 2002 that shrine was decimated and overnight um overnight it, there was a tar road produced on top of it making a tar road while you decimate a shrine and make a tar road uh, a tar road to be made in this city overnight requires a certain amount of authority right you need to be uh, the municipal corporation has to enable this let's talk about 20 years later when you look at that road today it's a massive 152 feet or some such uh, road with a really neat divider that runs through um and there's no shrine obviously there's no board that a shrine used to once exist um the then chief minister was once asked a question by a journalist saying that you know there was a shrine there now that it's all over why don't you remake the shrine it was a shrine to a great poet uh the response to that at that point of time was oh we actually don't know whether it was really the shrine to that poet it was probably just any other poet today on that um on that divider there are people who leave behind roses and a green cloth that's folded so it's just a divider and has that much of earth that hosts fresh flowers every other day that shrine in in principle therefore still exists that building doesn't exist uh, the ability for us to be able to read the poet's work has decreased it's very difficult to find his work online actually you should look it up this poet is called vali gujrati and his most famous poem is about how his heart bleeds when he is separated from gujarat now at this point of time if any of you as students would be interested in writing the history of this shrine how are you going to do it without being trapped in the politics of the history in the politics of its erasure in the politics of what the nation's policies around erasure are whether they are or not 
how are you going to distinguish between fact and fiction because there are a large force that is pushing you and me to believe that what i have known as fact is actually fiction now i'm going back to what ate was saying and saying who made it to the document if you read and write uh, if someone wrote about you if you made it to places where there were other people who had the skill of language you were potentially written about and you entered the archive most likely um if you were not in uh in the presence of those who had language or documentation on their side you were never written about and therefore the question of legitimacy becomes so fraught um and that's why we have a whole discipline that's oral history right is to really counter is to really counter the written word and say okay someone was left out and they were left out for very specific reasons it was not a um a leaving out by chance it was a systemic structural leaving out um yeah just some thoughts on what you are posed thank you uh, agni thank you adhya i now like to request those who are joining us on zoom uh, if they have any questions that they would like to ask our panelists they can either uh they can raise their hand and uh, then we we'll, uh, take it up hello hello i have a question please hello um i wanted to um Uh, hi, I'm Madan. I'm Kothi Sudhir here, uh, doing bachelor's of architecture at Sir. And I wanted to firstly thank you for the presentations you and discussions you have been illuminating. My question is about the relevance of museums, and my question is this: In my understanding, the museum captures uh, selected narratives of history. Now. Which narratives are to be selected? Uh, are they in in the hands of uh, the benefactors and donors? If that is the case, then are these always going to be looking at history? And what is the relevance of a museum which selectively erases uh, some parts of history? In that sense, can we do museums today? Which counter this loophole? Uh, you know, this this have a loophole to this problem, this politics. Uh, and if not, then we will continue to do museums. Thank you. I feel like Abhi, you should take that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, that's a. Uh... that's a question that's like the chicken and the egg question honestly for me um and while i talk about museums i'll also just meaning attach another system of legitimizing er- erasure or politicizing erasure or history in the same breath is textbooks right what textbooks and museums do or have historically done uh, at least in this country for example um is very clear no we 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 have a history of state run museums um in which uh depending on what is the regime in power and what is their primary ideology those are the kind of narratives um that will be put out and i mean that in a in in no way is new it's happened across regimes across independent india um now that's the that is precisely what the critique of a space like the museum is um that the museum cannot in whatsoever we claim objectivity right because ultimately it is a a selection what is meaning often we you know talk about the the role of the curator at a museum right um the curator in a state museum is generally um is either I mean is not an ias officer but is meaning reports to an ias officer um 
and has has very little kind of uh, investment in curatorial in, in a curatorial practice so like the way the state museum understands the curator is that person who takes care of the object or takes care of the artifact now um in the therefore our museums tell stories in particular ways um do we have a culture of others other stakeholders civil society thinking of museums as a as a viable option hasn't been so far um there are many many new private players within the country who want to set up museums or who are setting up museums uh and there's a whole range right from say um a museum of um sort of vessels uh a museum of modern art science museum to also doing sort of a big corporation like patanjali wanting to do a museum of herbs so the whole ambit like the whole spectrum of what there can be a museum about is open um and it's uh, it's no different than how how film is made uh, or or how history is then handled um you have a narrative you have a space you have a captive audience you will share a narrative um are we equipped as audiences or as people who go to museums to to kind of uh, critically assess what we are experiencing no and that's the biggest sort of uh, tool in the hands of mu- museum makers in this country at the moment there are unbelievable number of museums coming up in this in this country as we speak so um can we do something about it uh i'm not sure we can do something about the museum and its methods because it will directly be uh it will be a direct representation of the politics of those who are putting it together can we do something as audiences i think absolutely um i think that onus lies on the people who use access learn from Uh, museums overall and that's something i would say about textbooks also yeah i mean the museum is such a sort of like fascinating kind of historical object right but also because what it because it begins as a kind of extremely colonial tool of like housing displaced artifacts right stolen displays but of course curatorial work has radical potential and in a sense one of the challenges that you know radical curatorial work has posed to the kind of institution of the the colonial institution of the museum um that that puts the artifact in front of uh, you know it, it is interesting right like if if you take an idol and put it in a museum it can no longer be worshiped like what 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 like it loses its kind of uh it it loses one form of being sacred but then um gains another and i i i worked for a year at the university of british columbia at ubc at vancouver and they have a really really fascinating museum of anthropology uh where basically they have these huge collections of work that they stole from indigenous what well, i shouldn't say stole but they kind of stole it but that that was collected from indigenous um communities all along the kind of coast that western coast of canada and what they did is that they created spaces where on like so certain um artifacts that they have they're on display but they're also covered so you can you can see that it's there but you can't see the object because the object is sacred and can only be seen at certain times of the year and then they created these spaces where members of the community can come and perform their ceremonies with those objects um and uh make choices as to whether it can be seen or not seen and so uh what they have to do is sort of retroactively work with the institution uh, you know with with the kind of infrastructure of that institution that they created to be able to um to to be able to 
rewrite that narrative around how uh, what the role of the museum was as a caretaker of these objects but like radical curatorial work also really challenges the object oriented approach of a museum where like the object has a certain aura of you know like importance and what it says is no the argument is actually important and so how do you kind of put an argument together with in in, in so instead of like fetishizing the object um how do you kind of make a case and uh i think it, it, there is a lot of radical potential in curatorial work in that sense even as you know you're seeing a kind of terrifying terrifying kind of use of museums to kind of just put ideology in very very uh, uh strong and blatant terms down the throats of people i mean the museum also provides a space of respite from like the weather so you could go into that space and look at beautiful things uh for family you know there's a way in which they work in so many ways they do the work of transmitting ideology by like um anyways one more one more Uh, my name is Vaishnavi. I'm an architect and graduate of SEP and also GSP, so we intersect paths uh, as well. Uh, my question is about popular culture and new media and how that's become a way to kind of bring remote histories into the mainstream. Almost like imagine uh, the work you've done, the silos, suddenly is made into a Netflix documentary. And if it's made in the right way, it can almost become a supporting uh, link to your graduate reading that you would get. I was just wondering what what you both think about uh, popular culture and media, or like larger players and their role in bringing forward histories that are not mainstream. I think if you go looking for it, you can find relative material. But where where does all of it? Very in terms of just reaching a wider audience. I know we spoke about narrative, but we also spoke about visibility. Uh, just any thoughts? Uh, why don't you go first, Ate? I my I'm okay. Scared. Yeah. I mean I only wish that someone wants to make a Netflix documentary just because I'm sure that that will come with both bragging rights and uh hopefully some amount of money and then I can be independently wealthy. Uh, um but I I don't know you know I mean I think I okay so I, I'm going to like cherry pick from that question pick and uh, say the I think that it's a question of form and content here where like the form of how you put that information out really kind of changes the content. So um I imagine that if you know the the it, it, turning to certain kinds of media for putting work out there actually changes the sort of content of the argument that you want to make. Um I don't know. Uh maybe I don't know maybe could you just say your question again? I feel like I got lost a little bit in the end. If you just say the last part of your question. Uh try to resist the idea that my work should reach the maximum you know number of people possible because i think i it, i i think there's something really important about bring like you're not just trying to tell people stories you're also trying to i i i think of me would agree with this which is that you're trying to train a kind of critical capacity to think and so that work how do you do that work that work is so very hard it is so very hard and that's you know really the work of universities right like we're not trying to tell people give people information we're not which we're not trying to kind of turn the you know we, we're not trying to kind of put the university on instagram right um so that it reaches more people we're trying to kind of in, what does the space of the seminar afford right that's the smallest in a sense 
um, outside of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your student when you're in a seminar of say even up to 20 people it's a very intimate space where you're allowed to make mistakes and you want your students to feel um, like they can say things that they don't understand completely yet and then you're able to kind of bring them into um, a kind of dialogue in a way that they're able to exercise their critical faculties and then therefore be able to read, be able to speak, be able to write. These are three totally different skill sets. Like being able to read doesn't make you just be able to write. You have to really, really work at that. And um, so, so in a sense, my tendency is to move in the opposite direction, you know, into the smaller space rather than, because how on Instagram are you ever, or on Twitter, are you ever able to teach someone how to read and write? Those are just incredibly time consuming. I mean, it's taken us 10 years to publish this book. So um, I don't know, I, I, I don't have an answer, you know, like for how we're gonna like fix all of the kind of difficult ways in which uh, people have been sort of fallen into ideological traps. But I, the hope is that, I mean, I'm not, not the hope, but like, the, the point is to build infrastructures, right? So that I, and I, I think, I don't know, I, I, the university has so many issues, right? The neoliberalization of the university is completely putting such strain on the humanities in a way in which it's just so very hard to keep doing critical work at, at, at scale and support it and bring scholars into it. And um, so, I, I think we really need to also critique the kind of neoliberalization of the university if we're to sort of see that as a model for training critical thinking, that the training critical thought and bringing people into the humanities and seeing the value of doing historical work, even though it takes, you know, whatever, 10 years to write a book. Yeah, I mean, Sorry, that's very depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I get depressed by my <laughs> Um. Yeah, but I also don't know why it has to be an either or, you know, mm -hmm. why uh, being in popular spaces and uh, or on social media ha and being a book and being a museum, they, they, it's mm -hmm. possible. It's possible. Yeah. Some, at least theoretically mm -hmm. in my head, it's possible yeah. to exist in both those spaces. But I want to point to a couple of things. Um, which is the very nature of popular culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, popular culture um, is attractive, it's widespread, it's at scale, um, but it also functions on a basic principle of being able to isolate a whole bunch of other narratives and at the cost of those narratives become popular. Isn't that what the algorithm also does in a sense? Shadows uh, one set of ideas and, and, and multiply only one set of ideas. So, um, and in particular, when one is working with narratives from or of marginalized communities, the, the entire struggle or is really of somehow being able to come out of isolation mm -hmm. when you are working with or when marginalized communities are making their own point what are they fighting against after they are fighting against their where the violence or oppression is coming from they are fighting against this kind of very very well designed isolation where you have no tools available to popularize. So who can popularize? Yeah. Who is the popular culture available to? Let's also just yeah. do a scan of what is popular culture today. It's hyper-masculine. It's, it's like chest-thumping nationalism. It's all kinds, meaning it, it's, it, it's uh, extremely Brahminical. It sort of looks down on anything that is slightly critical. Yeah. That is our present day popular culture, whether we like it or not. I Me, mean, whether we want to accept it or not. Yeah. 
Uh, Agni, Atiya, thank you so much. I think the conversations that we've had tonight this evening have been incredibly interesting and exciting. And I think there are a lot of insights that we've got, you know. For example, whether it is looking at history not to fill gaps, but sort of reveal gaps. And the whole idea about legitimizing or visibilizing, say, certain invisible histories or invisible people. And the way in which we can, you know, try to include or bring in as much as we can into how we read and understand uh, history. I think our conversations that we will continue to have even after uh, this session today. So I think I would really like to thank you both again. Thank you for taking out your time. Thank you for presenting us your work. I think it's really helped us get some perspective on things. Thank you so much for inviting us and thank you for those really wonderful, thoughtful questions. It was really a pleasure to talk with all of you and uh, very much so with me. Thank you, really. Thank you for having us and thank you, Ate. I'm going to find myself in your inbox at some point. Yeah, me too. Yeah. We'd like to formally thank you for being here with us. Thank you again. Thank you, Monica. I'd just like to add that, you know, for the purpose of the discussion, it uh, becomes really important to acknowledge that the rethinking architecture of history, a collective, like our have mentioned, it becomes a way to think beyond a singular approach, and that patrons have the possibility to help manifest the context of conflict to be made accessible are really important, and uh, more history is being written and represented and experienced in the vernacular role and context become greater accessibility. So thank you all. Thank you for having uh, us presented this uh, panel to you. And uh, Randy? Yeah, so uh, just a heads up, we have another session tomorrow. We have three panels tomorrow. Uh, we start at 11 a.m. with Research 101. Uh, we have Shreya Shrivat and Sonal Batal on our panel, along with Yukta and Balak, who are our moderators. Uh, we have the second, uh, the, the third panel at uh, 2 p.m., which is Applications of Research in the Search and Environment, where we have Jeevan Sautla, Rushan Talavachala, and Harudya Singh uh, in conversation with Ashwini and Naomi. And uh, towards the end, it's going to be a short reflection session where we're looking back at the, looking back at the dialogues over the two days and big connections across the teams, teams discussed, where we get in conversation with all our panel moderators. So we hope to see you there tomorrow. And uh, yeah, have a great day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.